present the 2021 annual report in emergency medical services for the town of Pine Ridge. Thank you, Adam. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Where are we going to put you so we can hear you? Oh, you'll hear me out there. Oh, I'll be the podium. Oh! That's never been a problem. Thank you. All right. Karen, good. All right, good evening, Supervisor Clarity and town board members. Councilwoman Nguyen, welcome to, your, uh, to our first annual EMS presentation, and uh, usually semi annual. Uh, Mr. Abbott, I promise to keep it short, but 6 30 might be a push. I'll do my best. So, um, in keeping with the, uh, the traditional report format that we have done in the past, I'd like to start with uh, just looking at some of the data. The first piece um, is call volume. So if you look at 2021, NEQ ran 3,660 calls last year, uh, WEMS 3,954, an aggregate well over 7,000 calls. What's uh, totally amazing, and I double-checked the math because it didn't seem right at first, a 16% increase in, in NEQ and a 23% increase in WEMS. That is just unbelievable. That's unbelievable. We're not the only agency seeing this, and we're seeing it at a time when hospitals cannot accommodate the patients that we bring to them. So it's, uh, it's quite amazing, and we don't see the trend slowing down at all. Um, as you look at the, uh, the table below, I did it graphically, and you know, it's, sometimes a picture's worth a thousand words, sometimes not. Call coverage for us was 93% for NEQ, 94.4% for WEMS, and they both went down a little bit. Why? Because the call volume has jumped at an incredible rate. I mean, it is just a number that, you know, five ambulances some days would not have been enough, and we just couldn't uh, cover them all. Um, one of the other challenges we face is that even when we cover calls, the first or second out call, we are sometimes sitting at the hospital for hours. And literally, I, I don't mean that exaggeration. I mean, for hours. Um, we've had RGH go code black, meaning no patients, and now we're going to strong. So our transport times become long, or we're literally trapped trying to unload patients to a point where several times the ironic way EMS chief and I literally go to RGH to try and help clear the back floor of patients so we can get our stretchers free. CHS has come up with a brilliant idea and strong, we don't have the option yet, but they literally take a stretcher, load up the ambulance, and leave, and leave their stretcher there with the patient and leave. Um, it, this is a very, very difficult time for all of us. You know, pandemic, flu, whatever you want to call it, staffing shortages are real. They're real not only at the hospitals, but more importantly, what people don't understand, it's not the hospital's primary issue. It's the nursing homes. There's no place to take patients out of the hospital. And so if you can't take them out, you don't free up a bed. If you don't free up a bed, there's no for the next person to go. We took a person Monday night, a 94-year-old woman from Penfield, uh, congestive heart failure, distended abdomen. She got a bed this morning. She has been sitting in a hallway at a hospital in town for almost three days trying to get upstairs. So we are in tough times, and that is what's reflected. One of the other things that's worth mentioning, and I think next year in my report, or next time I report, I'll put a number for this, but though the call volumes are high, they're not all transport. So if we were doing 7,000 transports, we'd be in fat city, um, but we're not. So in reality, our transport rate is close to 50%. So the ambulance goes, the patient either doesn't want to go, the patient signs off against medical orders, they didn't need an ambulance, like we had a call yesterday at, uh, at a, a location in, in the center of town here, a person had been locked out of their house. The police thought, okay, well, it's cold out, so we'll call EMS. We went there, the person sitting in their car, warm and cozy. That's a call, right? That's a call, that's a unit out of service for a period of time. So I'll try and start adding some of that data. One of the other things that we've talked about and always said, we are in a business where minutes matter. So at the top of the next page, it's, it's about time, right? We have done our best to make sure we are meeting or exceeding the region's metrics. And for those of you that have seen this report consistently, for ALS transport vehicle for NEQ, for all of our calls, that's going to Wayne County and Penfield and to Ronquoy, 91.6% of the time we are there within 10 minutes. For Webster only, it's a moderate increase, which shows you that a lot of our calls are, are close to Webster, and that the fly cars can go a little bit faster than the ambulances. Uh, in, in WEMS, for all calls, 90.7. So for you know the ambulances, they don't go as fast sometimes, by rule, on the highway, we don't run lights and sirens. So if we're going into a rendezvous, or we're going down 390 into Brighton or Henrietta, where we have been going lately, um, we, the lights and sirens are not. So those are priority one call. We don't run the lights and sirens because the ambulances literally don't go fast enough to get out of the way of traffic. 
So they stay in the right lane, they go at appropriate speeds and then go. However, in Webster, 96.4% of the time, we are there within 10 minutes, which is a pretty good metric, I think. For priority two calls, 96.6 and 97.5 respectively for any queue, and for the town of Webster for WEMS, 97.3. And then for the last two buckets, I think now for the third or fourth year in a row, I've reported we are 100%. We are actually exceeding the, uh, the metric and, and no numbers fall into the 17 or 25 minute uh, mark. So I would say that overall, call coverage performance is pretty good, hindered a little bit by the fact that call volume went up dramatically and uh, we couldn't unload our patients. And response times continue to trend, I think, at a, a level that uh, is at or above expectation by regional standards. Operationally, as you all know, we finally took uh, possession and moved into our new base in uh, December 2021. And it's uh, everything we hoped for. So I, you'll hear me talk about this thing called the NEQ V2. And what is that? That is us changing our paradigm. So for the longest time, we've been the nomads, right? We started NEQ off borrowing space in the fire departments, got moved out of there, went to a pole barn that Mr. Um, uh, oh my goodness. Who? No, uh, Bolter. Mr. Bolter gave us on publishers, no heat, no bathrooms. We had to heat our, plug our trucks in. Then Mr. Viola, Andy Viola and his family took good care of us for more, almost a dozen years on Ridge Road. But, you know, the spaces weren't optimal. We couldn't engage with the community. We didn't have a place to sleep. We didn't have a place to eat. We didn't have a place to train. And what has happened with NEQB2 is not only are we now in a home that we can call our own, that we can rest and we can eat and we can train and we can be ready for the calls. All our vehicles are inside. The maintenance dollars have dropped dramatically because diesels like to be warm, right, Art? Right? They like to be warm. And we had them all plugged in outside and you start them up and they're blowing all kinds of blue smoke while stuff is busting. Now they're kept at a nice warm temperature, they're inside and they're stable. And the other thing is, it allows us to interact more with our crews. So now I get to be there and see them quite often. The other chiefs, which one is here, our Captain Kelly Hodge, get to interact, Sue gets to interact, we're coaching, we're mentoring, we're, we're training people differently, and we're seeing the morale in the whole building change dramatically. One of the points that that raises is that in the last 12 weeks, we've had over 36 applicants. We didn't have that many in all of 20 and 21. So 36 applicants. Now, we're doing our best not to steal from our friends, but all of a sudden we're a place that's not living on broken recliners in, in a garage to a place that's actually worthwhile. And as we continue to make investments in upgrade equipment and hopefully ambulances over time, we will continue to be what I consider to be a gold standard for EMS in, in, a, in a community. Um, as of January 1st, we've moved to two ALS and one BLS ambulances covering the whole town. Um, we are closely monitoring the call areas. We're, that's the second ambulance is now replacing what was in West Washington, so that uh, we now have three ambulances running all the time around here. And uh, we're trying to see where the call volumes are and response times to make sure that the west side is covered as well. But fortunately, Jackson Road is pretty central. We can zip down State Road, we can hit Ridge Road, we can hit uh, Clem Road, we can hit 104 if we need to, so we're still very accessible. Um, by staffing our three ambulances, our ability to provide mutual aid has increased. And that makes a difference, and the reason is that um, in the old days, prior to January 1st, one of the ambulances in town, West Webster, was not staffed, so it was not really available for mutual aid, and it was actually closer to Rondepoint than the Wyoming's ambulances were. And so by now having Webster as a consolidated town, and they, they grab us, we were able to go support Webster and Penfield more often than we have. And it, in all seriousness, we have gone to Henrietta and we have gone to Brighton for high priority calls, because some nights we just get tapped out in the, in the community. And so it's nice to know that Webster is now added value at another layer and level in the, in the region. We've also added two more RSI providers. So we had three, we lost two, we've come back up to three, and we'll be sending two more to class in the near future. So if you remember, what is RSI? That is where you can give medication to a patient to, to manage their airway. You basically paralyze them so that their throat becomes relaxed so you can pass a breathing tube. So it's for patients with head injuries where their jaws are clenched, significant trauma, sometimes uh, patients with strokes will clench down, and it's a way to help make sure you're getting life-saving oxygen through a, a controlled process. There aren't very many of these people in the community, and any two fly cars tend to go all over the place with this. Matt Lloyd is one of the busiest RSI providers in the county uh, in our area, and does an amazing job. Um, some of the other things we do is we now sit on the uh, Monroe Livingston Regional EMS Council, which we've done for a little while, and soon, uh, in April, we will chair the Public Information and Education Committee. So as you know, one of the things that we wanted the new base to do was get more engaged with the community. 
And so we are going to take up that role at a regional level and help increase awareness about EMS and all the things that uh, we do and some of the challenges we face in the community. Um, we've also really recently founded the Monroe County Executive EMS Chiefs Organization. So the police have an executive chief's office, the fire had an executive chief's office, and EMS had no way to really talk to each other. You know, we had the challenges that are going on in the city of Rochester. It's not an EMR problem. I mean, yes, they have challenges like all of us, but if they can't get offloaded at Stronger RGH, they get backed up too, then Monroe comes in, and around the quite bright, and gates come in, and then it's just a, a big sucking black hole. And so a few months ago, we said, you know what? If, if others aren't going to help us solve our problem, we, we have to do it collaboratively, right? It's easy to think of AMR and Monroe as commercial agencies, and another group of us as nonprofits, and a few of us as volunteer fire departments. In the end, we are all EMS providers in Monroe County. And so we are, we are chartering an organization called the Monroe County Executive EMS Chiefs Organization, and one of our first acts was to work with the county and ask for some of the ARPA money, right? Every week, the fear was 17 of us made 17 different acts. What you get out of that is zero, right? And it shows a lack of uh, unity and a lack of, of organization. And so we put together one, one proposal for a few million dollars to ask for training and recruiting money, right? We, we don't want you to help us fund our operations. We don't want us to help you, you know, buy stuff for us. What we need is we need people. Right? Without people, we don't man ambulances. Without staffing ambulances, we don't take calls. And our biggest challenge is we are losing people in this business faster than we're, we're recruiting them. Monroe and AMR have had classes where they're literally paying people to come to the class. They can't fill them. Uh, MCC uh, classes, EMT and paramedic, are not always full. And we're not getting people to graduate through. And when they do, what are they doing? They're getting their EMT or paramedic for a while here. They're either then going to work at the hospitals, which are now paying 45 to $50 an hour to work to staff their EDs, which are killing us, or they're staffing these FEMA ambulances going all over the country and getting paid $50 an hour to go somewhere else. So we are not keeping our talent here if and when we get it. So we've got to change that paradigm. One of the other things that we're doing is we've become one of the one of two test sites for the CAD integration and charting software. Why do you care about that? We want to ensure the quality of reporting in the community and in the, in the region, right? We, right now, we all have a PCR system and then we all have to kind of take the data from the computers and, and manually put it in. Well, that's fraught with errors and omissions and things like that, and it takes a lot of time. So we're trying to find a way to do a seamless integration, and NAQ will be one of the, uh, the beta sites for that. <clears throat> Earlier I mentioned some of the mutual aid we get, and I think it's just interesting to look at the table here to show all the places we go. So for WEMS, we obviously Rochester, a bunch of Torontoquoit, some into Penfield, then Parenton, Seabreeze, the town of Penfield and the town of Webster, those are both the West Webster side. So those things we knew. But look at the fly car. We always talk about it. Is the fly car model still you know, the best model? It's handy to have sometimes. We go into Rochester, Brighton, Rondequoit, East Rochester, Ontario, Penfield, Parenton, Seabreeze. You can see the list. It's pretty extensive. So it's nice that we have the ability to be flexible in our response so we can help our neighbors out, which, as you can see, we do quite a bit. We continue to do COVID testing, and we're also the recipients of some free test, test kits for the community, which we hand out on occasion. And uh, we will resume doing uh, home vaccinations for the shut-ins in February. The last bullet on this page is worth a few minutes, which is Nurse Navigator. Some of you may have heard about this on the media recently. There was a little bit of discussion. And I just want to explain, Nurse Navigator is not a way to, to not treat patients. What it is is to help relieve system overload. So you get a patient that calls and says, my foot hurts, right? So it's not I'm having a heart attack, it's my foot hurts. And the, the dispatcher at 911 will say, okay, are you having chest pain, shortness of breath, are you diabetic, difficulty breathing? No, 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 no. Okay, then I'm going to transfer you to somebody else. And they bump you to this nurse navigator. And then they're interrogated again, a whole other series of questions. And if it's deemed that the person doesn't need an ambulance emergently, then they're, they're put in a hold queue for AMR or Monroe, and then every 20 minutes they're called. And if at the next phone call they don't answer, they get an ambulance. Or they say the situation's changed, then an ambulance goes, or else they stay. And what we're finding, we've had two of these calls so far in our community, and there are patients that really didn't need an ambulance, right? So eventually they get there, we go pick them up as a priority for later, or someone else goes and gets them, or they find alternate transportation. But the idea is to not even get them to the ED, right? It is not the right place for them. And so, we all signed up as a, as a county to try this. We're the only other region besides Knoxville, Tennessee, I think, is doing it. And, uh, you know, its, it's real purpose is to help Webster. Very honestly, the two people were probably flukes. 
The real purpose is to alleviate the load in the city, which I think we will do over time. <clears throat> the next page is really a, a very quick one. In the old days, prior to January 1st, we had EMS, box, or EMS boxes and fire boxes. And what that did was, every dispatch we went on was related to a fire box. Well, it was hard for us to get data as to where we were going, what were our response times, what were our call volumes, and as a supervisor as well into data, we were also trying to be a little bit more data oriented. And so we have created new boxes. And if you look at the bottom of the page, we made what, Route 104, four boxes, so two going, or two going east and two going west, divided by, I think it's um, County Line Road. We added 10 boxes on the east side of town. We added four boxes in the village and eight boxes in West Webster. So what that means is at some point, probably next year this time, I'll be able to show you a, a graphical representation of where our call densities are, what our response times are. If there's a need for a satellite positioning or rotating ambulances, we want to start doing that level of understanding in our community in the near future. I'm going to take a breath. Any questions up to now or can march on? So what was uh, the result of the ask for monies from the county? Have you heard back from the county? No. So the ask was due by December 31st. They will evaluate in Q1, and I think they make decisions later. If I was to bet my dollar, we won't get it back. But we asked, right? We asked as a consolidated group, so it right. gives us the best shot, I think. Yeah, but I we'll see. <laughs> so the next page is something that I hope at some point in May we will celebrate as a group and recognize appropriately. We have 18 cardiac arrest days in the town of Oakdale. That's a big deal. 18. 18 people had an opportunity to go home after full cardiac arrest. This isn't our Narcan overdoses and things where we, you know, diabetics that are very low in, in uh, response. These are cardiac arrest to what we call ROSH, the term of spontaneous uh, cardiac uh, effect. So I've given you a list, and you can see it's quite a diverse group. And uh, I hope that with the supervisor's help at May at the start of EMS week, you can recognize these people appropriately. Because that's what we do this business for right here. 18 families had a different outcome because we were around. We also performed 13 RSIs in 2021, which is also pretty impressive. And um, <clears throat> as we go down, with the help of the payroll protection program in 2021, we finished the year in a pretty strong financial position. We were able to get some long-term savings, a small amount. We finished in a little bit uh, in the black more than we did in 2020. However, it was not without a lot of challenge. Our laborers' rates went up 13% last year and I expect they're going to go up again significantly. It is hard to compete with hospitals taking your paramedics. It is hard to compete with FEMA taking your paramedics. It is hard to compete with Dunkin' Donuts paying more at the drive-in window than we can afford to pay uh, our crews because of real budget constraints. Equipment and supplies went up dramatically. Um, all of our expenses are going up, and our reimbursement rates are not only unpredictable, but in some cases uncollectible which makes it very, very hard to save and invest. So I feel proud that we were able to do something a little better than the year prior, but it was not without a lot of challenge. At the top of the next page in 2022, we would like to ask for some financial help from the community in the form of some of the monies that the town received um, from the ARPA funds. So at some point in time when it's appropriate, you know, if we could sit down with the supervisor and our, our budget director and see if there's some opportunity, it would be helpful. Every little bit will help right now. And then as we start going into the next year, it would be nice to start talking about a more permanent solution to see how we can support EMS in the long run. One of the things that uh, we have said we would do when we had the new building and we are executing on is developing more relationships with uh, community organizations in, in the area. Webster Community Chess will be holding their meetings uh, next month at our base. Um, we are collaborating with them to share information, um, get the word out about them. If we come across patients that are having financial hardship, or need assistance, we're going to do some cross referrals. The Webster Health Education Network, we're working to help identify where some of the narcotic situations are because they don't have all the access to the data. We're helping work with the county that does patient follow-ups. They've invited me to a few patient follow-ups in town. And we're trying to get in the prevention of the narcotics pandemic instead of only response, right? It's very easy to think of an ambulance just as a transport. I want us to think of NEQ and WEMS as a community health support network, not just an ambulance. And so we're trying to broaden our reach. We're working with the Kiwanis Club to talk about some of the camps and scholarships they have to help get some of our children in underfunded uh, communities out to, uh, to things like that. Working with Webster Fairport Elks, the Chamber of Commerce, the Business Improvement District, and a whole host of other things. We are doing our best to represent the five of you appropriately and be something you're proud of. We don't just want to be an ambulance. We want you to say Webster EMS and NQ are 
part of the, the network of the community and they're an asset. And that's what we're trying to show here. And before I close and take the last breath, because I know Mr. Abbott's looking at his watch. Um, <laughs> he's not even wearing one day. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Abbott. Um, I can't end these presentations without thanking you. Right? I stand up here in front of this podium. I stand up on YouTube and channels and TV. I'm a talking head. Right? The people that do this work are the 72 men and women in this organization. The first is you know, the paramedics and EMTs. Their job is thankless. We can't pay them enough. We can't give them enough food. We can't give them enough sleep. Right? Nobody pulls up and says thank you, though they're getting better at it. But we really need to, at some point, appropriately acknowledge them in this community because they are the people that make all this data happen. The next one is the operations staff. So Deputy Chief Lloyd couldn't be here tonight, but Captain Hodge is here. Um, those two are the ones that make this business tick, right? Matt makes sure the, the, build, the equipment is running, and the ambulance is running, and the fly cars are running, and Captain Hodge makes sure that we have staff to keep them. That is their primary focus, and they do it without fault and exceptionally well. Our board of directors, who the supervisor and councilman Kale have met a few times, you know, there are some organizations where the board members are just members that have come up. We have a, an outside volunteer board that brings a tremendous amount of diversity and knowledge to the organization and gives me a lot of support, a lot of strategic support, a lot of direction, a lot of I'm going to knock it off, go get some sleep, right, and things that are necessary. And it's very, very nice to have them. Then joining us today in the back row is Dr. Katsetos. We have a medical director that actually comes to our base and visits our people. We have a medical director that is trying to build relationships with people, so when he calls them, it's not always a punitive situation, it's a coaching situation. That is something unique in the other. I, we're very, very lucky to have him and very, very proud to have him. And then the last person that I'll mention before I, I really stop um, is Sue. So Sue is back here sitting next to Kaylee, and we have Kaylee and Matt keeping the, the fleet running and, and staff, and we have Sue keeping the organization running, right? She is the one that handles our uh, all the phone calls that come in, she's the one that handles all our, our vendors and, and makes sure that operationally we are, we are in good shape. So it's those people that we have to really thank, not me. I just stand here and present data that they help me generate. And then, Patty, you know the last question I'd like to ask, right? Are we meeting your expectations? We are here at your, your pleasure, right? Should we do anything different? And how can we better not only serve the town, but the citizens that you have allowed us to, to serve for these last 30 years? And with that, I'll show you. I will say this, that you know, I've had an opportunity along with the supervisor to uh, get educated um, throughout the myriad of meetings that we've had over the past year. And um, it's a very difficult business to, to understand, and, and I thank you and your team for educating me. Um, I still have a lot to learn, and, you know, with any business, but yours especially is, is very difficult. And, and, and I just, you know, I want to thank you and your team for the professional job that you do. I've had an opportunity to um, sit in on two of your board meetings, and your board members are professional, very knowledgeable, and in and, 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 and very verbose conversations go on um, during those board meetings. And it was very interesting. And nobody was shy about voicing their opinion, the board members. And I, I really, really enjoyed um, seeing that in, in to a limited extent, participate. So one of the questions I guess I would have for you is, and I know you touched on it a little bit, is you know what what areas of the what, what can the town of Webster do, you know, to help you for the services that you provide our citizens? You know, you showed all the people that that, that, that you know your team you saved their lives. I mean that's huge, right? You're our ambulance service. So what can we do to help you? That question itself is, is step one, right? I mean, I appreciate it. John, thank you for coming to our board meetings. We've never had that opportunity to give not only you the insight, but for our board to see that the town really cares about what we're doing. So we appreciate that. You know, one answer is always money. That's not all we need, right? That's a piece. One of the other things that we need is, when you have time, come see us, right? When you see the animals on the street, say hi to the folks. If they're out and about, stop. EMS seems to live in this, this bubble that nobody acknowledges. You know, the firemen all go down to uh, the fire in Parenton Pines the other day, it was a big, big debacle, it was a tragedy. No one remembered the 12 ambulances that were pulled in to help take care of the people that were suddenly homeless and with, without clothes and blankets and heat. You know, we don't get the recognition and thanks. That is worth more than money. In, in the week between, or sorry, the period between Thanksgiving and Christmas, the most amazing thing happened for the first time in our history. People stopped by our base. 
They brought food. They took pictures. They brought pizzas. We have never had that. The other day, Sue called and said, hey, someone brought, brought a, a check. I'm like, who? I don't know. He's one of the neighbors. Just showed up. That, that is what we need, right? We need a little bit more of this. And you know, John, I know through your help, we'll get it. But we'll also take a little money when we get a chance. <laughs> so you're saying, next time I come, bring the money. Bring a check. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say thank you so much for all you do, you know, and um, saving lives is priceless and across the board, and also I think the community knows all the hard work that you've been, you know, doing, dedication and everything else. We will try to do our best to help you succeed. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I know that a lot of companies out there are having staffing problems and you've, you've received a, quite, a, quite a number of applicants. and. Um, you're struggling with overtime to cover your shifts, and you, you went over the schedule at one of the board meetings. It, it's, you know, I'm glad I'm not doing your schedule. I'll tell you that right now. What a nightmare that is! Holy smokes! So, you know, what are you doing strategically um, to address the staffing issues? Well, you know, I think uh, it's a very good question. First of all, we're trying to be competitive in pay, right? But the difficulty is, you raise the hourly rate. And then you still rely heavily on overtime. Now you're getting a double, right? Now you're getting exactly. a one and a half times hit. So it's a, it's a tough thing. There are agencies in our in our county that aren't giving overtime. You know that rig doesn't get staffed. That rig doesn't get staffed, and they just run light. We've made our, our best effort not to do that, but that kills us financially. And Captain Hodge is really 20 years old. She just looks like she's 30. I mean, it, it is a, it is an ugly thing to do, right? Sorry. So, <laughs> so, no, the reality is that, you know, Haley has put together a plan that we've tried to develop teams and we're trying to stabilize our schedule so that everybody knows their work routine. Now, it's interesting. I thought that would have been a great thing and everyone loved it because traditional first responders work on a wheel. And NEQ historically has been kind of what I call a, uh, a Tetris game. We put it out, who wants to work when, and then Haley sits and puts this mishmash together. So we're trying to stabilize that. But it, it takes time to move that ship, right? right. Um, the other thing, John, is you know the new base helps. I'll tell you, that sure. people, people are seeing that, um, and it's little things. So every month, Sue and I sit down and we write birthday cards. Did when when people, huh? I didn't hear we write birthday cards, right? I handwrite yeah. birthday cards. We when people do good things, we try and recognize them. Some, like I said a little while ago, a thank you in the in the day room sometimes means more than anything else you can do. So by trying to be a more active and uh, integrated organization, we're trying to, to get more people in. I mean, you can ask them, they're here. Ask them what's, what's doing a difference if you want. But uh, that's what we're trying to do. Well, I think you're doing a great job providing an invaluable service to our community. Um, I certainly know that providing medical care and emergency care specifically is very challenging these days. And everyone is feeling the stress of that. Um, I did share with you and Councilman Cahill the piece that was on CBS morning, uh, Sunday morning show where um, Saginaw Harbor was in, in danger of losing their ambulance. Um, they're not necessarily close to Watertown. There's not, not a handy place that, or a quick place that an ambulance will come from. And uh, they are now 100% volunteer and they are staffed by, I believe it's 10 or 12 high school students who have stepped up because if you're 17, evidently you can do the EMT training. They are staffing the ambulance in that town and that's how it survived. Um, so when we look at the professionalism and those who provide care to our town and service, we're really very blessed. Bill? Thank you a lot for the presentation, as always, very thorough. We understand your difficulties, and we'll do the best we can to help. Thank you, Chair. Has there been any movement? I know that we were talking <clears throat> several months ago when the essential versus non-essential. That's so, we, so what Councilman Kale is referring to is EMS still does not exist in the state of New York in legislature. Right? We are either the town, a town gets to choose a provider, either their own provider or a contracted provider or something else, or it falls to a fire district. And you know, subsequently we struggle with getting grants because we don't exist. We don't get any. We don't get much from the assistance of firefighter grants, which is billions of dollars every year. EMS gets a fraction of a, literally a fraction of a percent 
Um, it's usually fire-based EMS that gets it. And uh, Assemblyperson Lunsford is trying to help put forth legislation with an assembly person, or sorry, a senator from up near Watertown area. Mm -hmm. It has been presented several times and it, it dies on the vine. There's so much opposition from the fire uh, just well, because they're trying to get reimbursement for to get into EMS. So there's a, they have far more organized lobby than we ever will have. And so we're having a very, very hard time. And so that's why every community is having to find a way to just to get their EMS to support. I, I sit on another um, EMS board a little bit to the east of us. Three nights a week from one to six in the morning, they shut down their service. They're the third busiest ambulance service near Syracuse because they can't staff and they, they don't have the money to pay the overtime. So they can only pay what they can pay and they've chosen to. There, there's an agency south of us in our county that is staffing one ambulance in a fairly busy district because they can't get people and don't want to pay the overtime. So we're getting the points of making very, very hard decisions. And in all seriousness, with, without the effort of Captain Hodge and, and her people to help us keep our schedule full and then us finding a way to balance budget and pay the overtime, we, we'd all be in the same place. I and mean, during the holidays, the city ambulance service was offering triple time. How the heck do you afford that? Triple time. Couldn't fill their ambulances. Right? I mean, this is the problem we're facing today. It's not simply a money problem. People are burned out. Right? We're sick of wearing these stupid masks. We're tired of being exposed to patients that are ungrateful and unwilling to pay. We have one patient today that we were at. It's our 31st time we've been there in eight months. 31st time. Right? And, and we can't get her help. I've spent my day today. In fact, one of the phone calls here was from her doctor. I have spent my day trying to get her. She's in a hole. She's not old enough for lifespan. She's not old enough for Medicare or Medicaid. She is not sick enough to forcibly get admitted. She's psychologically healthy enough to not get MHA. And she just calls us. And my crew is getting tired. We're getting tired. She's taking up resources. But this is our challenge. So, you know, the crew chastises me. I mean, you know, what are you doing? If, if we don't find a way to get that person the resources, then we'll just keep doing this forever. Eventually, she'll fall down and hurt herself more severely and have a bad outcome. And I'm not going to let that happen. And she's one of 10 that we do that for in this community. So I don't know what the answer is. And at some point, I hope that the state government will acknowledge us. But until now, they have not. <laughs> yeah, I pretty much knew that was going to be the answer. But I wanted you to have the opportunity to educate people that don't really know that you have that you're classified as not essential. Yeah. When you provide life-saving services, I just don't <laughs> understand. Other than, you know, like you said, lobbying politics, yeah. which Take a long it's, time. It's, pretty, it's pretty sad. It's just not right. Supervisor Flaherty, before you go, can I have two more minutes? Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. One thing I forgot to bring, Sue reminded me of looking at her. We brought some surveys, so I can't share with you the surveys because I got patient information on the bottom. I'd like to just read some of the comments. I'll only read five. This is from a patient who gave us all strongly agrees in the survey questions. My copay of $250 is a hardship for a sick person needing help. This should be taxpayer funded for the benefit of the public. Very courteous, friendly, got me out of a difficult position with ease, made my ride a breeze. I don't know what ambulance he was in, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was not the patient. I only answered questions that I could. The patient, my wife, passed away on December 4th call. I'll be donating to your cause. God bless you. I can't say enough about how wonderful the Webster team is. Webster is very, very fortunate. The EMTs were extremely helpful and friendly. My husband had fallen and I could not get him up by myself. They were wonderful to him and me. Brian and his helper were extremely professional, polite, and efficient. I'm certain they helped save my husband's life with the care they administered immediately. My husband has dementia and was totally uncooperative. They handled him the best they could. My thanks to Kevin and the crew. And I could do this 20 more times, but I, I won't. I'm going to find a way to share this data with you in a sanitized way because this is the stuff that our crews do every day. I send out every month surveys to all of our prior month's patients. We get probably, what, to 10% back? Yeah. 10% back. And, the people, and we, get found, we get some bad data, right? People are unhappy with some of our service and always unhappy with our bill. But it's nice to see this. And then what we do with this data, because on the survey I, get, I add the crew's name, so we're going to use it for internal recognition, to share the comments internally and let people know that there are people out there that appreciate what we do. So, all right. Sorry, now I promise. Great. Thank you, sir. So I just, one last comment is with respect to, you know, your new building, which is just absolutely beautiful. And, you know, I'm sure they, they, they deserve it. I'm glad they have it. And it will most definitely help with your recruitment. I think it's been, it was a long time coming. And, um, you know, everybody worked very, very hard 
to get there, especially you. Um, and, 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 you know, plus what tears went through during the construction process, which I saw firsthand on numerous, numerous occasions. <laughs> I have, you know, I, I learned a lot about, you know, what was going on over there. But, um, you know, to go through that thing and see it from basically when it started to after it's being, it's been furnished with the beds and everything. You know, education, it, it's incredible. It's, it's beautiful. So, long time coming. Congratulations. And I'm glad, uh, glad you had a new home. Thanks, Hey, Ahmed. Uh, <clears throat> without the last two minutes that you jumped in with the survey results, I just want to congratulate you because your presentation at the beginning was 23 minutes long. And for all those who are here that were here back on November 16th, my monologue was 27 minutes long. So Ahmed is more succinct than me, right, Bill? It appears so. Really. It doesn't it, though. Um, but all jokes aside, November 6th, I mean, this was the a recap of 2021. And I really do appreciate that. And we're going to get you out of here tonight. I just want you to know that and this is important for us to know about. Um, but November 16th dawned a new era. So I'm more interested in 2022 and the continuing relationship because on November 16th, many of the people that are in the room here know that that's when the board uh, decided to award NEQALS the whole town under the town's CON. So a lot of the stats that were shown here for tonight for 2021 will be significantly different when Ahmed is back here in January of 2022. How about June? Let's do it early. Okay, because you know what, that would be good. Let's because do it early. you know, obviously, I could, I, I have a lot of questions I could ask, but I, I'm going to save them okay. uh, because it's just not fair at this point to kind of compare 2022, where there is no more lease services to the West Webster Fire District, and how that all fits in. Um, and I have John said we had met with the board uh, of. Nicole's. One thing that was said in that, and I can't stress it enough, and I'm going to end on this, the essential versus non-essential. Unbelievable uh, that you're not essential. The funding and how to have a long-term uh, viable sustainability model for EMS. I said at the board of Nicole's, I'll say it again, let's get through all this. I know Charlie our town attorney and Patty and uh, John are working with Ahmed and your to, to amend the contract in place between the town and uh, Neekwals to reflect this new era. I want to get past that so that we can actually work together on whether it's state assemblies or state senates or federal to do something about that essential, not essential, and that long-term funding. And that's all I have to say. So, so you, that, did, you did see a significant decrease in your revenue, and that you're not staffing West Western Fire Department anymore. Really. I believe that that, that that amount was what, 300 to 350 thousand dollars per year revenue, right? So, when West Webster got out of the fire or, or the ambulance business, they say they're saving 300 to 350 thousand dollars per year, correct? I think so. Plus, with no longer equipment, maintenance, annuals cost to me probably a little, yeah, okay. better more. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Clary. Thank you, everybody. Thank you hope, very much. Hope, uh, Thank you. I hope we're meeting your expectations.